what happens when 12 children are forced to take a vacation with their parents together at a lakeside mansion? Lydia Millett will be here to talk about her new novel, A Children's Bible. How do you explain Henry Kissinger's guiding philosophy? Barry Gouin will join us to talk about his book, The Inevitability of Tragedy, Henry Kissinger and His World. Alexander Alter will give us an update from the publishing world. Plus, our critics will join us for the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. I'm Pamela Paul. Lydia Millett joins us now from outside Tucson, Arizona. Her latest book is called A Children's Bible. Lydia, thanks for being here again. I'm happy to be here. How is your quarantine going? Well, you know, I am not sick. No one in the family is sick, and we're not hungry, and we haven't lost our jobs yet. So I'd say it's going all right. Are you reading? Because I feel like some people are saying they're having trouble reading, and other people are doing nothing but reading. You know, I've been reading, but it's been mostly nonfiction research for the book that I'm writing now, and just the stuff I read for work. So I haven't been reading a lot of fiction in the in the past couple of months. You're already working on your next novel. Actually, what I'm writing now is a is nonfiction. It's a sort of it's it's called a bestiary, but it's a kind of combination of, I guess, what you'd call memoir and thoughts about animals and religion and intertwined forces in culture that relate to to extinction and our love of the wild. Several of those themes are ones that you cover in a children's book. I'm probably most notably environment and kind of end times and also religion. Tell us a little bit about the story you are telling in a children's Bible. So this is a tale of a group of children and mostly teenagers who are being forced by their parents to spend their summer vacation together in a rented robber baron kind of mansion in the country and who strongly resent and dislike their parents. And in the midst of this, a storm comes, a kind of epic storm, and with it a great flood and chaos descends on the house that they're living in and and the children sort of rebel against their parents. Okay, so If you weren't clued in by the Great Flood, you might be clued in by the name of the narrator, Evie, or Eve, I think is about 15, that you are doing something allegorical here with the Bible of the title. What function does the Bible have in this story? The stories that used to be often made into Bible stories for children, the parts of the Bible that were translated in especially the 40s, 50s, and 60s, for children to read are selected parts of the Bible. For example, the book of Revelation, the Revelation to John is typically left out of children's Bibles. It's not left out of my children's Bible, but it was deemed too harsh and dark and bloody, I think, for children to to read. And so, in, in children's Bible stories that, that used to proliferate, aren't, aren't as common now, often illustrated, you would have you know, the, the Noah's Ark story and various more child-friendly pieces of the Old Testament and the New. And so I've used to structure the plot kind of some of the events from those Bible stories. And, and then also there's a little boy in the book, the baby brother of, of Evie, who, who narrates it who's given a children's Bible. They come from a secular family in in New York, and he's given a Bible by one of the mothers that they're sequestered with in this big summer house. And so he starts to read it, and he doesn't really understand it. His favorite books are Frog and Toad and George and Martha. (laughs) As they should be. As they should be. So he sort of interprets it in his own little boy, little secular boy way. And so there's a sort of also a parallel there. So it's his Bible, the children's Bible, and it's also it's also sort of the framework for, for the plot of the novel. It's interesting when you talk about child-friendly as defining what ends up in a children's Bible, because the stories, of course, are, are still fairly terrifying. Um, they are. <laughs> I remember getting up to Cain and Abel in, in my own children's Bible and then being like, all right, I think I'm done here with this here <laughs> book of tales. There's a lot of brutality, there's, there, but there's not the sort of prophetic, apocalyptic 
gore of of the book of revelation but yeah of course even the you know the noah's ark story is is extraordinary and, and apocalyptic in its own way of course it sort of has a happy ending if you want to read it that way where animals get saved and the good people get to live on after the flood Talk a little bit about the children of the title, because as you said, they're they're not quite children. I mean, they're they're mostly teenagers, and they seem very sophisticated. Right. So you know, I'm never too interested in, in developmental verisimilitude with characters. Like they are sort of hybrid child adults, as teenagers really are. But they, the kids in this book, all they they do use a lot of swears. You know, they're they're quite harsh in their language and judgmental, but at the same time, they're Preter naturally articulate to a certain degree. And I think because in a sense I wanted to respect their voices, I wanted to make them authoritative and sort of straight guys in the book against the chaotic collective of the parents who are right. who are objectified generally for, I hope, humorous effect, but they're they're sort of unable to manage their families and their lives and the teenagers and a couple of young children who make up the sort of band of roving humans at the center of the story, they are mature in, you know, in certain ways. Essentially, this is a book envisioned for adults to read, and I don't, and so I don't feel like I need to sort of talk down to to either children and teenagers or to those who are reading the book by by infantilizing these, because, you know, we all know how resilient teenagers can be and how selectively brilliant they can be whilst also having these blind spots. In the book, though, they're sort of forced into a situation where they are more responsible and, and kind of wise than the adults around them. And I'm curious if you see the book as a kind of indictment of the, this generation of parents, and I guess I have to include myself in that. Yeah, and I include myself. Yeah, so, you know, there's a, a generational schism over over climate and extinction that's getting more and more visible to the mainstream. And that's partly because of the gestures of activists like Greta Thunberg, who's just a year older than than my own daughter, and young people whose, whose time horizon stretches decades beyond the, the personal lifetime horizons of those of us who are already out of our, you know, 20s and 30s are the ones who will be so profoundly affected by our generations in action on on making sure they they have a livable future and you know this generation is is starting to notice uh, and, and get angry and and i think the the rage is long is long overdue and i think it's the only rational response to the threats we we face so so this novel is about that kind of righteous anger of the young anger over the looming emergencies of of extinction and runaway climate change, because I didn't feel it had been written too much about in literary fiction yet. Anger is what we need. We don't need anxiety management. We don't need therapy, because the future is going to be a fight, and you can't fight without anger. So you've brought up climate change. This is obviously a book very much about climate change. And in our review, the critic refers to your OG status among writers on climate change. How do you feel about being associated with the term environmental writer? Is that the way you think of yourself? Because you, you've you studied environmental science and have worked in conservation. Now, I never have thought of myself primarily as environmental in my interests and in fiction. It's just that now the environment and you know the natural world, they're very clearly our life support. And so I've just always, I've actually always disliked the word environment and environmental. I don't, I don't think it's, it sounds so dry and stodgy and wonky, you know, but really what we're talking about is the whole of the world that we co-evolved with and, and our physical life support. And so, yeah, I do write, I think increasingly over, I'll say the past decade or so, I've written more directly about these matters because I think they're existential and I can't write around them anymore. For a time, I didn't want to directly address these matters of existence because it's difficult to write about them in a way that's not polemic, in a way that's frankly bearable to read. <laughs> and so for a long time, I sort of held myself apart and only addressed these climate and extinction crises sort of laterally in the writing. 
but it was sort of an elephant in the room for me. I couldn't not write about it uh, at a certain point anymore. So yeah, I have become preoccupied with the failure of our culture to change our way of life, to protect our future and the, the future of the other critters that, you know, that we depend on. Well, while that is a very serious subject, it certainly isn't dry in this book. There's a lot of humor in it. There's your distinctive style and sensibility, which runs throughout your work. And yet, I have to say this, it does seem like each book that you write is a little bit of departure from the previous book, even though that the, your, your style runs throughout. I wonder, do you feel like you're constantly challenging yourself and experimenting and sort of forcing yourself to do something new? Because Sweet Lamb of Heaven, for example, was a kind of thriller. This is very much not that. You put it very kindly. I think I just don't like to write the same book twice because I have a short attention span. So I, <laughs> I'm unable to sort of replicate previous books. I'm glad that my style seems consistent in some way. I specifically with this book, because in the past I've tended to write books that are more satirical or lampoon-like on the one hand and more oriented toward humor, and then on the other hand, books that are less so like Sweet Lamb of Heaven that really are more about ideas and abstraction and are, are perhaps more earnest. And so with this book, I wanted to try, I explicitly, in my mind anyway, wanted to try to write a book that was based on ideas and took as its subject things about which I'm passionate, but also not have it be humorless. So I really, my project here was to to try to make a serious book that also contained humor. And, and of course, we get humor generally by objectifying. And so, so the parents became my victims in that way. So in the book, of course, there is this flood, this disaster, this impending end times. And here we are, your book is coming out in the middle of a pandemic. Obviously, that's not something you could have predicted, I'm assuming, um, unless you, <laughs> you, you somehow did. How does it feel to have this particular story out in the world at this moment? Well, you know, it is a kind of direct parallel because, you know, in the book, there are these epic storms and floods and, and the pandemic, there's disease. But in real life, both of them are being caused by a massive structural failure to address looming threats, right? So the, the, the scale of the disruption that we're living in is a product of bad national management, you know, selfish and, and stupid political leadership at the federal level. It's not a natural disaster. It, it, it spiraled out of control here because of irrational behavior at high levels of, of government. And so exactly like runaway climate change, it's the product of, of a void of political will, of reality, denialism by, by the powers that are, that are running the country. You know, it didn't have to be this way. This isn't Ebola. It doesn't have a 50% case fatality rate. Its scope and, and economic effects are, are the direct result of basically a failure of national security. And I think there's a very clear, not even a link, it's part of the same problems of our exploitation and, and abuse of the natural world, wildlife and of animals in general. It's bad behavior on our part and bad policy we make or don't make to prevent that bad behavior. Are these the issues, I'm assuming, that you're continuing to explore through the nonfiction book that you're writing right now? I do. I do explore them. You know, medieval bestiaries were these compendia of, of animals and also sometimes minerals and occasionally plants, but stories would be told about them to illustrate good Christian comportment. They were morality tales. And so my book is about all these critters, all these beings that exist in the natural world, but also about us, sort of, and about myself as an example of us, sort of. <laughs> and so the book sort of wants to be a new kind of bestiary. You know, it's not Christian as such, but it does link morality and ethics and even things like love to specific animals and how we see them and the roles that they play in our lives. We should say at this point, on a, a slightly lighter note, that your pug has been participating on the sidelines <laughs> of this interview, uh, yeah. which is, I guess, one of the, the benefits of recording a podcast during a quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> you can call it a benefit. That's, that's charitable. He appreciates it. He's actually lying on the bed now holding a 
really disgusting, decrepit, small stuffed cat in his mouth that is sort of his security blanket and smells really bad. Well, let's hope for all of our sakes that he's not there the next time you join us for the podcast, (laughs) Lydia. I, I hope to be with you again in person one day. Thanks so much. Lydia Millett's new book is called A Children's Bible, and it's reviewed this week in the book review by Jonathan D. So here's a request for our listeners. I get lots of feedback from you, some complaints, lots of kind words. Really appreciate it. You can always reach me directly at books at nytimes.com. I will write back. But you can also, if you feel moved to do so, review us on any platform where you download the podcast, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or somewhere else. Please feel free to review us and, of course, email us at any time. Barry Guin joins us now. He is an editor at the Book Review and the author of his first book this week. It is called The Inevitability of Tragedy, Henry Kissinger and His World. Barry, thanks for being here. Thanks, Pamela. I'm glad to be here. Let's start with the obvious question, or at least it's an obvious question to me, which is there are so many books about Henry Kissinger. Why write another book about Henry Kissinger? This book really began with a rejection. Over the years, I've written many articles and reviews, but never thought I had a book in me. But an editor asked me over lunch one day if I'd be interested in writing a short biography of Kissinger, and I said yes, and he said, let me talk to the other people at the house. So I began reading up on Kissinger, and finally the editor got back to me and said, it's not going to work, we don't want to do it. But by then I had read so much and had begun developing ideas that I thought were different from what was in the standard biographies. Walter Isaacson had a very good biography at the end of the 20th century. Neil Ferguson is working on a massive biography now. He's finished one volume and he's now into the second volume. He says that's all he's going to do, but I'll believe it when I see it. But my take was you can't just look at the particular actions that Kissinger took or that Kissinger slash Nixon took. You have to look at the ideas behind them. You have to understand where Henry Kissinger was coming from. And in effect, this is a book that tries to explain where Henry Kissinger was coming from. Before we even get into those thinkers, what is it about... Henry Kissinger that interested you? To be honest, one of the things that interested me from the very beginning was his self-deprecating wit. And that may seem trivial, but no less a major foreign policy analyst than Hans Morgenthau said that irony and wit were very important qualities in a statesman. And he pointed out that Abraham Lincoln had those qualities. And just for a contrast, we might want to think about the irony and wit of Donald Trump to give a contrasting example. So, you know, the wit and the irony drew me in, but the obvious intelligence, the obvious complexity of his thought. I thought the people who simply attacked him as a war criminal were not getting it. And I wanted to counter that. In part, I wanted to counter that because Pamela, as you know, so many of our colleagues at the New York Times or in the literary world in general think of him as a war criminal and aren't willing to go beyond that. And part of my reason for writing the book was to keep an eye on those friends and associates who had that view and try to answer them. Christopher Hitchens was one of them. I think he not only wrote a book, but then there was a documentary. How do you respond to those people who say, why write about him as anything other than a war criminal? That's what takes me 460 pages to do. The book took me about seven or eight years to write. I can't remember quite now when Hitchens died, but certainly I was still in midstream when he he died. And 
if he were still alive today, I confess, I'd be terrified to be in a debate with him. Not that I think he's right in his charges about Kissinger, but he, he was just such a brilliant polemicist and rhetorician that, that I, I just wouldn't have been able to match up to that. I would say, you know, put my book next to his book, read them both, draw your own conclusions. Well, what would you say Hitchens got wrong? I think Hitchens simply oversimplified Henry Kissinger. There's even one point, and I, th- I think it's a vulgar point and not representative of Hitchens and his general abilities, but the vulgar point was that Henry Kissinger pursued foreign policy based on what was in his own self-interest. And I think that's simply wrong. Kissinger had a deep love for America. It's a very ambivalent love for America. And one of the things I try to do, I mean, there are chapters in the book on other German Jewish intellectuals, in particular, Leo Strauss, Hannah Arendt, and Hans Morgenthau. And all of these German Jewish intellectuals really had a deep love for America because it had saved their lives, saved the lives of their families, or at least some of their families. And at the same time that they had this deep love of America, they were really ambivalent about America. They saw problems. They saw problems that have come out today with the whole Trump era. They had worries about the nature of democracy, which most Americans don't think of. But all of these German Jewish intellectuals had seen how Adolf Hitler had used the processes of democracy in his climb to power. And they had a greater sophistication about this than most Americans. Kissinger, of course, was himself a refugee from Germany. Did you write about that, about the influence of that personal experience? Or did you focus more on writing about that and intellectual thought that came out of the Holocaust experience? It's both. I have a chapter about Leo Strauss and Hannah Aron, and it's an effort to show how their thinking and their experience with Weimar Germany and the Nazi regime impacted their thought. And they were about a generation, maybe a little less, older than Kissinger. Kissinger left Germany in 1938 with his parents and brother when he was 15. So he didn't have the full experience that the other German Jews I talk about had because they were adults when they had to get out. But the impact was the same. And the impact was how could a nation that had been so good to the Jews, all of a sudden turn around and begin first to treat them as outcasts and pariahs, and then simply to murder them. How could this happen? And they all struggled with this, and they all attempted to come up with answers to this. Kissinger less so, because he's a diplomatic historian and not a historian of of politics in the same way that they did. But they all were impacted by this profound turnaround in their fates and came up with answers that I think have a family resemblance in which as much as Hannah Arendt and Leo Strauss did not get along, I think there's a family resemblance between the answers they came up with and the policies that Henry Kissinger pursued. Kissinger is known for the philosophy or the approach of realpolitik. How did that come out of the Holocaust and the the writing around the Holocaust and that and the answers these writers came up to that question about how could this have happened was his approach to diplomacy a kind of way to avoid it happening again or is it not that direct? I think not that direct. I mean, obviously. Kissinger and the others I mentioned were writing certainly with an eye to it's not happening again. And in fact, part of their concern about America was not that the Third Reich would happen in America, 
but that American democracy itself was subject to these same forces that they saw operating in Germany. A key figure here, and I should mention him, is Hans Morgenthau. Hans Morgenthau was Kissinger's mentor, not directly his teacher. Morgenthau was at the University of Chicago, spent a year at Harvard. Kissinger took his course. Morgenthau thought Kissinger was his most brilliant student, and that's in a class that included Brzezinski, Samuel Huntington, Stanley Hoffman, the all-stars of that time. Kissinger was the most brilliant. And they started a long friendship that went up and down. But there are points in the book where Morgenthau, who's really the father of realpolitik, the father of the perspective that Kissinger implemented when he was in government, there was a moment when Morgenthau, in effect, takes over my book. He becomes the hero of the book because he's the one who lays out balance of power, national interest, all of the ideas that we associate with the realists. Think of what it's possible to do, not what you want to do. And so a lot of what Kissinger implemented really comes out of Morgenthau's own ideas. Many of the figures you write about in the book, most of them are dead, Hannah Arendt, Morgenthau. Kissinger is not. And in fact, you have edited Kissinger. You've edited his book reviews for the New York Times book review. I know you tried to interview him for this book. Tell us a bit about what happened with those efforts. And if you had interviewed him, what would you have wanted to ask? I did tried to set up an interview and was turned down. I mentioned that in the acknowledgments. I I thank everyone, and then I say Henry Kissinger would not be interviewed for this book. I was disappointed, of course, but in thinking about it in retrospect, I'm not sure that I would have gotten very much out of the interview. Kissinger, in his later years, is very much concerned with burnishing his reputation. And I suspect that if he had given me an hour or even two hours, which would have been a lot for him, he would have spent most or all of the time simply justifying his own actions. And so I wouldn't have really been able to dig in to those philosophical questions, those questions of policy that I'm so interested in and try to deal with in the book. I think the most that may have come out of an interview with Kissinger were some minor details. I say, for instance, that I'm not aware of any contact that Kissinger had with Leo Strauss, who's one of the key German-Jewish figures I talk about. And I would have been curious if there had been any contact. Friends of his have told me, no, they they didn't have any connection. But I think that's the most I could have gotten out of an interview with Kissinger. I wouldn't have gotten anything earth-shaking. I wouldn't have gotten anything revelatory or anything I think that I really could have put into the book. Why do you think Kissinger wouldn't talk to you? I think it's my New York Times connection. You mentioned that I edited him a couple of times many years past. He would not have remembered me. There wouldn't have been any association in his mind with those book reviews that he did do for us. But what he would have associated me with was the New York Times itself. And Kissinger has always felt that he's been ill-treated by the New York Times. A former Times journalist, Philip Taubman, wrote a book many years ago called The Partnership about a a group of men, Kissinger, George Shultz, Sam Nunn, and one or two others. And Kissinger refused to talk to Taubman. George Shultz finally intervened and said to Kissinger, look, you really should talk to him. And it was only then that Kissinger agreed to an interview. Well, I didn't have a George Shultz on my side, so I was never able to overcome that New York Times barrier and paranoia that Kissinger has. 
All right, I think that we can confess here to a certain blunder on our part that may have perhaps weighed in or factored into Kissinger's prejudice against the New York Times book review specifically. What happened with Kissinger's last review for our pages? You know, I don't have the full memory of this. I mean, I can tell you in fact what happened, but in terms of the backstory and the ins and outs, that I can't help you with. I think, I'm I'm not sure what the review was. I think it may have been a review of a biography of Margaret Thatcher, but I may be wrong about that. In any case, the last review he did for us, by some glitch, his byline didn't appear, and it was a cover review, I should mention, but his byline did not appear on the cover the way it usually would. And it was, as I, Pamela, I think you know more of the backstory than I do, but he was furious and he was convinced that it was the publisher, Arthur Salzberg, who made this happen. But but think about that. Think about the level of of paranoia and and self-protection, that here we are giving him the cover of the book review, and in his suspicions, he thinks we leave off his byline as in some way an attempt to undermine him. Well, if we had wanted to undermine him, we never would have assigned the review to him in the first place. But as I say, Pamela, you know more of this than I do. It was a production error, is the very exciting backstory. It was an error with the printer. That said, given how much you know about Kissinger's school of thought, his way of thinking, where did that paranoia come from? That's for Henry Kissinger's psychiatrist to really say, look, he grew up at a time, you know, very formative early teen years when he couldn't go to soccer games, which he loved soccer. He could not really walk across the street because he had to be fearful that gangs of Nazis would beat him up. He's denied that this has had any impact on his thinking. And I think that's just nonsense. I mean, what I think he's concerned about, and it's a legitimate concern, is we shouldn't reduce his thinking to these childhood and teenage events. And that's right. Apart from whatever individual familial factors went into developing his paranoia, I think we do have to put a lot of stress on his upbringing. The other thing I'd say about his paranoia is once he was in office, and we can see it even now after he's left office, it's, you mentioned that he's attacked as, as a war criminal by the left. But the right doesn't like him either. And in 1975, when his influence was beginning to wane, he was being attacked on all sides. He had friends nowhere. The left was attacking him as a war criminal. The right was attacking him for detente and being too soft on communism. And he was really just left on his own. I think for any of us, that might create a sense of paranoia. What do you admire most? about Kissinger? And a companion question, what do you think was his greatest fault? Let me start with the second. I think the danger in his kind of realpolitik, and it's true of his mentor, Hans Morgenthau as well, is that it can produce a certain kind of callousness. I think it's, as I argue in the book, it's absolutely necessary to look at the world from a position of power. Who has it? What is it possible to do in the world? What is it not possible to do in the world? But at the same time that you say that, that you can turn that into a policy that just ignores all of the human suffering that is out there or that you may have, in fact, caused to whatever degree by your own policies. And I think there is a kind of callousness that we see creep into Kissinger from from time to time. His critics would say, not from time to time, always. But that, I would say, is, for me, the great failing of Kissinger. I think there are a number of good qualities. Let me, for the sake of this conversation, highlight one. Kissinger was really willing to absorb 
an enormous amount of guff from Nixon and others around him. He told, I think it was Seymour Hirsch, you can't imagine how much anti-Semitism there is in this administration. And I mean that going right up to the top. We know that Nixon was anti-Semitic. There were times when Nixon would refer to Kissinger is my Jew boy. Now, what should Kissinger have done? Should he have walked out of the room? Should he have resigned in a, in a fit of, of legitimate indignation? Or, and he made this choice, should he stay on, swallow his pride, and pursue the policies that he thinks were helping the country, and in fact, from time to time, reining Richard Nixon in. It worked both ways, by the way. Nixon sometimes had to rein Kissinger in. But the question here was, what do you do? And I think of all people, it's Baudelaire who speaks of the heroism of everyday life, where What's heroic in the choices you make never become prominent, never become evident. They're just the choice to keep on keeping on and to swallow all of the outrages for the sake of the national interest. Let me just mention, at the time that Jim Mattis resigned as Secretary of Defense, I thought he took a very non-Kissingerian approach. I would have preferred that he stay on, swallow his pride, and continue to act, as everyone said, as the only adult in the room. At some point, all of this may become impossible and intolerable, and I, I, it's very hard to step into anyone's shoes when they're in that position. But I was disappointed then, and I really admire Kissinger for being able to hang on there in order to do what he thought was in the best interests of the country and the world. All right. I want to talk a little bit about some admiration on my part and maybe some heroics on your part of one kind, which is to say that you wrote this book while working full time at the New York Times Book Review. You began working on the book after being at the Book Review for well over two decades. You have covered many terrible books, many great books. How did this influence your going into writing your own first book? All I can say there is, as I say, I probably wouldn't have written the book if I hadn't gotten that rejection and had already started to work on it. I had repeatedly told friends, I just don't think I have a book in me. I can do short pieces, but not a book. But once I got started, look, I think it can be true of any editor of the book review, and I, I really do hope that more editors of the book review will write books. And what's true is that part of the job day after day is you're seeing galley after galley after galley, one terrible book after another terrible book. And at some point, you kind of think to yourself, I can do better than this. <laughs> And that was certainly one of the factors. But, but as I say, I don't think it was the, the determining factor. I think the determining factor was sheer accident. But once I got into it, I, by the way, I should say, I could only work on the book on weekends. I found that after working at an intellectual level at the book review all day, what I wanted to do when I came home was to turn on a basketball game or a rerun of Law and Order. I couldn't readjust my brain to then work on the book. So it was only Saturdays and Sundays that I worked on it. But I did it with, even to me, an amazing stick to itiveness. Even my doctor said to me, Barry, I never thought you were going to complete this book. But here it is. Here it is. And it is, in fact, true that you did do better than many other people. It's gotten stellar reviews so far. Congratulations, Barry. Thank you. The book again is called The Inevitability of Tragedy, Henry Kissinger and His World by Barry Gouin. Barry, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Alexandra Alter joins us now from her Brooklyn studio. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? Doing fine in Brooklyn and keeping up with all the latest sales trends in the publishing industry. Is it grim? It is not as grim as you would expect. Well, it depends on what kind of book you're publishing. Let's put it that way. 
big name authors are still selling pretty well, which is impressive. You know, if you're Stephen King or John Grisham or Delia Owens or Celeste Ng, your book is still selling. And if you look at the, you know, the top 20 on Amazon, that's what we're seeing. Joanna Gaines, of course, has two books high up on the list. I think if you're a a lesser known author, a debut novelist, or you're publishing a nonfiction book that's not going to grab people's attention right now, the picture is quite different. One interesting thing that has continued, it was a real, really pronounced trend when this epidemic first took hold, is the sharp, sharp rise in juvenile nonfiction, children's activity books, educational books, coloring books, study aids. According to NPD BookScan, the study aids category rose by 83% between March 1st and April 4th. So that is actually sustaining a lot of publishers right now. They also saw a 98% increase for language arts books for young readers. So that is something that readers are still managing to find, even though so many brick and mortar retail locations are closed. Other interesting new trends, there's been the resurgence of coloring books. I don't know if you remember that trend a few years ago when suddenly adults were coloring quite a lot. It was, um, I was always kind of jealous. I, you know, when I see my kids doing projects, I sort of want to drop everything and get involved. But um, there's been an uptick in coloring books for both children and adults again, and other home activities, cooking, things like that. One interesting statistic that I came across this last week was that the number of books that agents are selling into publishers actually hasn't decreased that much. So there was a comparison from April of last year to April of this year that showed that in terms of book deals, that it had only decreased 8%, but that they pointed out Last April, April 2019, was actually an unusually busy month, and so there would be an expected decrease anyway. But 9% even isn't that bad. So it seems like people are still writing books or wanting to write books. People are still reading books or coloring into books. I guess one of the questions is, where do they get the books? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting point about the deals being pretty consistent You would think publishers would be super cautious right now, particularly given that, you know, even though things are relatively stable, they are, of course, losing money. We've seen that in a recent earnings report from Hachette, which only captured, you know, the very beginnings of the of the pandemic and the economic shutdown, but still showed that it was pretty bad for business. So it's interesting to see people still making deals. I think there was a drop off right in that first period of stay at home. I think just because people were were collecting themselves and figuring out how to work from home. But after that, it really picked back up. And then as to your question of where people are buying books, that's also shifted. It's quite interesting. I've heard from publishers that Target has become a bigger piece of their business. That's, you know, considered an essential business. And so their book displays have remained intact. They haven't given that space over to other merchandise. And they're also selling quite a bit online. Target.com is selling a ton of books for people. Walmart.com is selling a ton of books. And Bookshop.org, which is the new website for independent stores, is also selling quite a bit. Is there any update on when people think libraries might reopen? That's a great question. And, you know, a handful of libraries have tried to continue to provide services to their communities, either through drive-through operations. In some cases, I think this is quite clever. They're using lockers. And so if you put an order in, you can go to an outdoor locker with a combination that you're given and get your books. But I, I don't know in various, you know, obviously the situation is changing state by state. So I don't know exactly when libraries are set to open. I'm sure it'll depend on the local government's orders and what they deem essential right now. But we are seeing more bookstores starting to reopen in a limited fashion as a handful of states lift their stay-at-home orders. Books a Million just said it's reopened the majority of their stores. Barnes & Noble is, is looking at that in states that are reopening. And I think independents are doing it more on a case by case basis, either beginning to offer curbside pickup and things like that in states like California that are starting to reopen. Well, I like to think of books as essential. Alexandra, thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for having me. 
Joining us now, our critics, Dwight Garner and Pearl Sagal. Hey, guys. Hey, Pamela. Pearl, let's start with you. What did you review recently? I reviewed a biography of Kierkegaard called Philosopher of the Heart. Kierkegaard is one of those thinkers right now. He just seems to be everywhere. I keep running into him and pieces about how to think and feel during the quarantine, how to think about suffering, how to think about idleness, boredom. He's just very much in the air. And I was excited to see this biography, which wants to be sort of like a Kierkegaardian biography of Kierkegaard, meaning it wants to sort of really not tell the story of a life chronologically, but sort of float from event to event and to see, you know, where the philosophy emerged from the life. Unfortunately, I missed the conventional sort of structure of the biography, as I say in the review. I missed the way that in an ordinary biography, you get the sense of how a life happens, how it unfurls, that this event led to this sort of epiphany, led to this event. The way that this biography reads, it's a little bit more scattershot. But for people that are sort of coming new to Kierkegaard and and want to understand why he seems to be such a sage of understanding suffering and welcoming it and welcoming anxiety and saying that these things are what make us human. This is, it's a pretty good introduction. So it's an introduction to his thought as opposed to Kierkegaard the man. It's a biography. So it's supposed to tell you a bit about both, right? And I find that it's more useful in sort of distilling his ideas and less interesting and revelatory on the man. And in the review, I do say that there are particular challenges in telling the life of Kierkegaard. He really led a life of almost perverse placidity. He didn't do anything. You know, he he left his like, he left Denmark five times, maybe. He generally wrote and took these long walks. And there was like one heartbreak that was like the seminal moment of his life. So it's, you mm-hmm. know, there's not a lot of drama, but the job of the biographer, I think, is also to sort of unlock the drama in the ideas and the drama in the construction of the ideas. And That happens a bit more fitfully. I mean, I think it's really useful. I think this book is really useful if you haven't read Kierkegaard and you want a sense of the breadth of his thought and just primer in that situation. I think it's it could serve you well. I'm curious when you're reading a biography for the first time. Obviously, there's so many different kind of biographies. There's the kind of someone called it recently a sperm to worm or womb to tomb biography, and then there are those that sort of look at at a life through a particular lens or look at a particular part of someone's life. Do you prefer to kind of start with that epic sweep so you just kind of know where did this person come from and where did they end up and how did they get there? Are you okay with kind of going in at an angle the first time you read about someone? Oh, I I love experimental biographies. I love biographies that are breaking things up and remaking the biography. The biography can be such a dull genre, you know, if it plods along and, you know, gives us event after event. That said, I think there is something in me that does admire seeing, as I said before, like how a person happens, you know, you know, I, Mm -hmm. I, I am interested, especially in early childhoods. I am interested in, in the role of, of ancestors and context and place on a person and on a philosophy. So I did miss some of that. I I realized, so maybe I'm realizing while reading this unconventional biography that I'm more conventional than I realize. (laughs) So Dwight, are you seeing Kierkegaard everywhere? As you both know, I was a book review editor for a long time at the New York Times Book Review. And there's a certain type of review, a stunt kind of review that I forget who called it this, but they called it the evil Knievel on Kierkegaard kind of review, yes. which is which is you find some some mad person to review a really high or someone really high on a really low thing, someone really low on a high thing. I always think of that. But I, I want to hear more about what what was he sort of like Oblomov? Was did Kierkegaard just stay in his couch all day? Was he really into his food? What you know, <laughs> what did he do with his time besides think? <laughs> he walked. He walked. He walked. He walked. He walked. Until the soles of his shoes would fall off. He was always going back to his cobbler. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't lazy, but he there was like a very solitary spiritual quest that he was after. But one thing he did do every day is he used to take these long walks, and he wanted to be surrounded by people. He did want to talk to people, and he called them taking his daily people bath. So he would take his people bath, and then he would come home to his desk. But he wasn't an isolated person. But he was a very serious, very committed person. He died very young and felt he would die young. So he worked frenetically most of his life and then died in his early 40s. God, hmm. people bath. That's that's a phrase people that's going to stick with me during this yeah. period. I miss my people baths. I think we all miss our people baths. All right, here's my segue. Speaking of death, Dwight, what did you <laughs> review this week? You know, Lawrence Wright gets some sort of award. Give him all the prizes for coming up with a really intelligent virus-based thriller. It's called The End of October. Of course, Lawrence Wright is the New Yorker staff writer who's the author of The Looming Tower, 
about 9-11, which won the uh, Pulitzer Prize and the author of Going Clear and many other books. But he, he has written a novel about a world in which a virus like COVID-19 takes over the planet. And it reads like a rocket. I mean, it's really good. It's like a Tom Clancy book written by an intellectual. He's really taken the time to research viruses. And you learn a lot while you're reading along about you know the history of plagues from the beginning on. And he knows a lot about science. He talked to a lot of scientists. So you feel like you're learning a lot while you're reading this sort of pretty great thriller. I mean, I, you know, as I say in my review, Lawrence Wright's not going to make you forget that there are still great writers in the planet. It's a little bit hackneyed at times. It's a pop novel, but it's extremely prescient and it, it, it really reads. Did you find yourself parsing, okay, here's the difference between the Congoli flu and COVID-19 and trying to figure out like what applies, what doesn't God. apply? He gets it all so right. I mean, you know, the first things that happen are it's just like our world. There are runs on stores and the hospitals are overwhelmed and sports stop and the stock market sinks. And he even has the vice president made the point person, you know, for the failed response. And, and you know, the president uses a tanning bed, et cetera, et cetera. But as the novel goes on, the, the virus, the Congoli virus, which he's invented for his novel, is kills many more people than COVID-19 does. I think the uh, it kills something like 30% of the people who, who get it. And so you know, we essentially, we go back into a pre-industrial world. I mean, um, Supreme Court justices die. Brad Pitt dies, for Christ's sakes. What about book review editors? What book happens <laughs> to us? Critics. You know, there's, there, there's looting, the refugee camps for children. I mean, it gets very dark. I don't want to give it all away. But he's invented a, a virus that's, that's it seems to be much more serious than, than COVID seems like now. Have you been doing any kind of pure pandemic reading, Parle. I mean, you used to edit many of the reviews of science books when you were at the book review. Do you find yourself going back to that kind of nonfiction or are you veering very sharply away? No, I mean, I was surprised by that. You know, I was, people were talking about the book, you know, The Great Influenza and all these other books, but I feel I feel at the end of the day, so saturated with you know, just reading about the news and paying attention to things that when I do read serious nonfiction, it's, it's, I don't know, it's about the natural world. I think it's what I can't see and access. I, I was reading that, that terrific book by, is it Robert McFarland, Dwight? You reviewed it, Underland? Yes. So I'm reading things like that in that genre when I, when I get to read nonfiction. But no, I, I haven't been going back and reading the history of plagues. I think I've, I have too much plague. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, still, I'm still in New York. I'm still in Brooklyn. And you, know, you just feel surrounded by it all the time from the first thing in the morning to the last thing at night. So I think I'm really looking for ways not to think about it. All right. I want to go back, far back to an earlier time, pre, very much pre-COVID, courtesy of a listener who wrote in. Her name is Brigitte Dale. She is a PhD student of history at Yale. And she asks, I wonder whether you would consider spending a few moments on the NYT Book Review podcast speaking with your contributors about how they got their first jobs in the book world as writers, editors, publishers, reviewers. I'd love to know more about their career paths, and I imagine other listeners might likewise be curious. So speaking for this listener, I am curious. Let's start with you, Dwight. How'd you get started in all this? Uh, you know, I was kind of a little journalism geek from the time I was pretty young. I mean, I, I really loved magazines. And I, I was the kind of kid who, you know, I was the editor of my high school newspaper. I was the editor of my college newspaper. But I, as I came to realize as an editor in, in devouring magazines, the things that I loved most about magazines were the quote unquote back of the book. I loved the back where the critics were, where the opinions were. And I began to slowly write reviews. And then when I was in college, I went to college in Vermont and there's a local bookstore down the street and they would give me for free any book that I would review for the college paper. And I'm like, hey, this is pretty nice. And then, you know, like a lot of my friends, I wanted to sort of go into writing or journalism. I wasn't sure which. And my friends would have a hard time selling articles of any sort from Vermont. But when I was still in college, I began to uh, write book reviews for local alternative weeklies. And then I would send them other places. And then I got an invitation to write for the Village Voice while I was still in college, a book review. And it was one of the great phone calls of my life, getting this phone call from the Village Voice. I can still remember it in my little dorm room. And then, you know, I, I, I stuck with arts journalism. I became the arts editor of a small alternative weekly in Burlington, Vermont, and stuck with criticism. And I've always been a big reader, as I said, of back of the book and critics. I just kept on with it. And I a lot of my favorite writers are critics. I mean, I'm almost doing the thing that I really, when I was a young writer, wanted to, to be and to do, because my favorite writers were often people like Pauline Kael, a lot of the other great critics, Dwight McDonald, you could I could name a list that goes on forever, but I, I love the voices and the hubbub and just the the, the argumentative style. So I'm, I just went on from that. I, I moved to New York and began writing criticism for various magazines. I was one of the founding editors of Salon Magazine, Salon.com in 1995, and I was their books editor. And it sort of all happened from there. 
I want to ask you, though, Dwight, because you are an omnivore of the senses. I mean, you mentioned Pauline Kael. You're a big film watcher. You write a lot about food. Did you know that you wanted, and music as well, I mean, did you know that you wanted to do books criticism as opposed to some other form of criticism? Yeah, I think so, because, you know, books are everything. You know, it, I mean, if, if you're writing about music, you're writing about music, and I love good music writing. But, you know, one of the great things about being a book critic is, is that every week, it, it, you sort of feel like you're perpetually in grad school in a really in a really good way. I mean, there's just a different topic, a different kind of writer. As a book critic, you can pronounce on every aspect of living in the world. I think it was Iris Murdoch who said, there's, there's so much learning to be found in book reviews. And I just feel lucky that each week I get to turn my gaze in a, in a really new direction and write about something maybe I've written about for three or four years. And I feel very lucky to sort of be able to use a, a range of my mind all the time. Parl, how did you get your start? Well, it was a bit of a different time when I was coming up. And, you know, I think criticism has always been like... <laughs> Are you saying <laughs> Dwight is older? I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was a new era, a new generation <laughs> was coming forward. And so there wasn't, yeah, there, there wasn't really like prescribed paths to take. I, criticism has always been my favorite genre. I was one of those, and even when I was little, I used to wait for the Washington Post book world to come and sort of devour it. And But, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't really seem tenable. I was like, how does one become such a thing? I don't think I ever thought about it. I think I wanted something to do with language and I wanted to do something with, with words. And so I was like, okay, you know, I did an MFA. And while I was there, I started to notice that, yeah, I liked the process of writing fiction or thinking about poetry, but what I really liked was the conversation about it. And I started sort of writing reviews, pitching small reviews for places. And it just, you know, after, after I graduated, I applied for a job editing book reviews at Publishers Weekly, then did a books editor job at NPR. But it was just, yeah, I was applying for jobs and suddenly realizing on the side that I was able to keep writing, keep pitching, and and that I was finding a space for myself to do this kind of work. But yeah, it's my it's my favorite genre. It's my favorite form. One of the great things about criticism is that you sort of have to, I mean, I sometimes compare my work to, when I'm talking to people about it to being sort of a pitcher. On a, and I'm not even a great baseball person, but being a pitcher on a major league baseball team because I get to throw every like five or six days and you're only judged on what your most recent game is. I mean, the great thing about writing in general and criticism in particular is that you don't need any, you don't need a PhD. You don't have to go to college. It just, it's, you have to prove it again and again. Someone writes Brilliantly, it doesn't matter where they're from, who they are. It's just there or it's not there. And you can tell that with critics, I think, especially sometimes. All right. Once again, the books you reviewed this week, Dwight? I reviewed Lawrence Wright's The End of October. And Pearl? I reviewed Philosopher of the Heart, The Restless Life of Soren Kierkegaard by Claire Carlyle. Thank you so much for joining us again this week from Brooklyn and West Virginia, respectively. Dwight, Pearl, talk to you soon. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, not right away, but I do. The Book Review Podcast is produced by the great Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with a major assist from my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Thank you.